What does that do? Romans chapter 15 and verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read actually the beginning of this chapter. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Well, uh, it's, I want to come to the subject that the Jews and the Gentiles sing from what people call, sing from the same hymn sheet, the Psalms of David. And uh, to come to this as the unity of the, of the church, the Roman church was a young church, as it were, uh, established uh, for... <laughs> Some, a few years by the time Paul was writing this, maybe 10 or 20 years, uh, not much uh, longer. <clears throat> and the, the big joining up in the church in the early days was the, the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He came for his people, the Jews. He was the minister of the circumcision, of the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. What a confirmation of the promises that were made uh, to them by giving himself as a sacrifice for uh, sin uh, for the children of Abraham, the children of Isaac, the children of Jacob. Uh, this he did, verse 8, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So he came for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Now, the scheme of God then, a large part of it, is to bring people together in Jesus Christ. And we uh, see that, even as our friend was saying this morning actually, uh, we're coming to some similar texts. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. So that was a very new thing for the Jewish people, that the gospel was for all nations. And then we see at the end of the epistle to the Romans, in fact, summing it up, similar to the passage we read in, in Ephesians, Romans 16, verse 25 to 26, Paul says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of them. Now, a revelation is a revealing and unfolding. The revelation of the mystery 
which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And that mystery then, as we read in Ephesians chapter 3, is, is explained a little bit more there. Ephesians 3, verse 3. Um, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote for in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the Gospel. And then in verse 9, uh, uh, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. There's a union, a communion, a union, a fellowship, a common bond of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And uh, we might quote the um, how the prophets of the old days, they wrote, they were searching uh, these things. Uh, first Peter says, of which salvation? Verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. We prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So this scheme of God then is that the uh, Jews and the uh, and the uh, Gentiles are brought together in this one church. Whole, uh, we've emphasised, completely different people. Uh, don't be uh, upset or shocked or frightened if very different people appear in church sometimes. The Lord brings together different people. This is amazing. In Jesus Christ, the differences are... Uh, as it were, put aside, and he is all in all to us. It's wonderful what he does, and it's a marvel. But it was like that with the Jews of the Old Testament, and then suddenly there's all these strangers from very pagan, heathen backgrounds that come to know Jesus as their saviour, and they join in this one church. Well, of course, such a church, he said, well, they're asking for trouble. Now we get on with our sort of people. We don't want to mix with them. But this is what the situation was. Well, there's a scheme then now in it for a unity. There's a true church unity, by the way, as well as the false ecumenical movement. There are true Christians that are to keep together and to love one another. Now, the God of patience, chapter 15 of Romans, verse 5. The God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another to Christ according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Well, what a challenge. One mouth, one mind, one mind, one mouth, receiving each other as Christ received us and being like minded one toward another. And that that um, verse five we saw previously written to them is a is a is a kind of a a uh, a what's it called? I, I, I call it an I'm telling you what I'm praying for you type of type of verse now the God of patience and consolation grant you he's talking to them but he's telling them what he's praying uh, for them he's saying it as a prayer 
but he's actually saying it's rather like when we pray we pray together in a sense we're talking to each other about the things that we're talking to God about it's very sweet isn't that in a when we pray together that we can say for each other what we're praying but we're actually praying to God and that's that's very precious of course now this all brings together the unity of the church and the whole the whole context of it in chapter 12 verses 1 to 5 remember this this is our our aim again here these chapters by the way from Romans 12 onwards they're so precious we love the doctrines of salvation we love the doctrines of justification by faith and of God's grace in the first 11 chapters but what about the challenge of applying it as people of God as the church of God that's where that's where the challenge is for us not just to understand it is to begin with and to believe but then to to live it isn't it and this is what Paul then starts in Romans 12 again I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God and then dealing with it uh, then uh, more personally that I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office so we being many uh, are one body in Christ we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another so there's this amazing feature in the church that all the different parts are like different parts of a, of a body and and uh, there's one body and yet while well, we're all different and they work uh, together that's the target that's the aim in the church in this sanctification this holy life of giving ourselves giving ourselves to God a living sacrifice the whole of our lives given to God and then concentra concentrating as it were verse 2 not being conformed to the world but being transformed by the renewing of our minds which obviously is an incredible incredible life ahead for everyone who is a Christian this is the challenge it isn't just, oh, I believe I'm saved, forget it, don't tell me anything about God. It's now this is this commitment now to, to, to be giving ourselves to the Lord truly. Which you think, well, where do I start? Where do I start with all that? And of course, verse 4 in chapter 15 is a great help. It tells us, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope so there's a somewhere to learn in the scriptures the whole of what's been written in the bible of course at this time there was hardly anything apart from the old testament but what a testament the old testament is the the, the amazing relationship with god that people like abraham and sarah had that uh, isaac and rebecca and Jacob and then uh, all the prophets uh, with Joseph we think of them before and then Joshua uh, the, the names of them Isaiah and Jeremiah how they knew God speaking to them how they knew the fear of the Lord how they knew what sin was and what the Lord's commandments were it was all taught to them in the scriptures and these, these things are written for us for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope the Bible then is the source of the unity of the people of God uh, the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the Jews as it were that have become Christians have become our brothers the Old Testament history for the, has become 
my history. Your, if you're a Christian, it's become your history. Your family tree is in here. You can trace it right back to Adam now, through Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob, and through King David, and then through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your family's, your family Bible, literally. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that we're included in it, in Christ? As Romans 11, verse 24 describes it. If thou wilt cut it out, it's comparing now the Jews and the Gentiles being one olive tree. We were, as it were, uh, Gentiles, the, the, uh, the non-Jewish people. We were cut out of the um, olive tree, which is wild by nature. Some of us were very wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature, against, against our nature, as it were, into a good olive tree. If you've become a Christian, you've been grafted into the good olive tree as a, as a descendant of Abraham and, a, a, and, a, and adopted into Jesus Christ. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, these are the, the unbelieving Jews at the time, be grafted in to their own olive tree? The one people of God in the one olive tree, the one family tree. So this, this Bible unity is uh, picked up uh, several times here by uh, Paul in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 19. It refers back to the law of God and uh, to dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written. So he's saying, look, this is what the Bible says. Do what the Bible, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So he's quoting there from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Actually, if I've, if I've caught all these, I believe in the epistle to the Romans, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32 three on three separate occasions it, maybe it was a chapter that he'd been reading at the time and it was close to him um, <clears throat> but um, three references there so referring there to the law of God and the promise that God will take revenge so teaching the moral law the moral principles and then in chapter 13 and verse 9 Paul reminds them of the Ten Commandments. Uh, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not false, bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, if there be any other commandment. So he refers back there to the Ten Commandments. So the moral law of God, while the Gentiles were told that, that the uh, ceremonial law didn't apply to them, the moral law clearly did. And so they learn from the moral law that's taught in the Old Testament. The Gentiles can join in with that great heritage that the Jews have. And they will get then closer and closer together as they follow in the moral law as a rule of life in the Christian life. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, but what it means is that we keep God's moral law as it's put here. And then in chapter 14, Verse 11, and there's also much here. It says, For as it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Paul again, quoting from the Old Testament and uh, reminding people they must give an account uh, to God. And here he's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter. 45. Isaiah, the, the great, you might call him the, the evangelical prophet, much of the gospel to be found in Isaiah. And so this quotation here is being used to, to teach people again. And it reminds them, of course, well, writing this to many Gentiles, this is written, where is this written? Let me turn back. I'd like to read the whole of Isaiah, perhaps they say, like the Ethiopian eunuch did when Philip spoke. He was reading Isaiah, wasn't he? It must have been one of the 
fascinating Old Testament books. I think the, the second most quoted after Psalms in the New Testament is, uh, is Isaiah. <laughs> and then we come to the use of the Psalms in Paul, in Romans uh, here. And he's already been, I, I, I should have said to you, I suppose, that in our verses here, in chapter 5, in verse no, in chapter 15, Romans, verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. There, of course, Paul is quoting from Psalm 18, which we read together earlier. Now we'll come to that in, in a moment, but he's already been using the Psalms. Now think, we're saying, Paul has said, look, take up your Bible, read the scriptures, they're all for your learning, they're all for your comfort, they're all for your patience. Use the Old Testament, now we've got the benefit of the New Testament and the Old all together. And he's saying, take up these things, you'll learn from them. What do they learn from the Psalms? What do they learn from the Psalms? There we have in the Psalms, we have the prayer book and the hymn book of the people of God. And Paul is saying, take up this book, take up these books, this whole Bible, and in there, you've got a hymn book, you've got a prayer book. What precious things we've got here. And it, he's, he's used this already in, in chapter 3, I won't go through them, verses 10 to 18, many, many quotations, mostly from the Psalms. And then in in uh, bringing, a, bringing a conviction of sin. It's amazing, isn't it? That in the Psalms, there, there, there is a very serious conviction of sin uh, throughout them. And that's part of the songs. Part of the songs people sing. We sing that there's sin. And we look to the Saviour. So these great themes are in these Old Testament psalms, hymns and songs. And then in uh, Romans 8, verse 36, we uh, looked at this in a whole sermon, I think we spent on this, how Psalm 8, verse in, in the middle of that great section on assurance, the great assurance that the people of God have, that they will not be separated from the love of God, it throws in this text, as it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. What a strange thing to say. When you're in the middle of all this blessing and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then it says, we're killed all the day long. Counted as sheep for the slaughter. And that quotation was from Psalm 44, which we looked at previously. And we saw then, back in the old time, that the people of God <coughs> suffered in the Old Testament, and yet they had great assurance too. And so these texts, they, it's the same experience that David has as a believer, that the Christian has. And so these Psalms are, are very uh, are perfect forms of worship. And then in chapter 15, and in, and in verse 3, again, where Paul has again taken up his his quoting of the scriptures again and in verse 3 quote from Psalm 69 the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me there looking to the great example of the Lord Jesus Christ in his all his sufferings and in his crucifixions and everyone was against him yet this is what he did for his people and this is used there uh, not only to as a psalm that sings about Christ, but what, how he could give himself fully. No selfishness was there in him. And this is given then here for our example, as Paul quotes it. And he's probably thinking, well, I could I, I, I quote that, but he, he could sing the whole psalm. Fill it, be, be filled with the greater, the greater blessing. If you ever buy the... Um, Trinitarian Bible Society do a do a um, 
a calendar. Uh, I forgot the name of it now. Uh, every every day it has a verse, a Bible verse on it, uh, for each day of the month. Words of life, what's it called? I was reading the other night. Uh, Precious thoughts calendar, or golden thoughts calendar. It's called little one verse a day from the Bible, and then at the bottom of the page it says, "For greater blessing, read the chapters." Don't just read one verse, read the chapters. And this is really like this. When Paul quotes a verse, you know, I want to go and read the whole psalm now. I want to read the whole quote from Isaiah. I want to go back and read the whole of Isaiah. And uh, so he quotes these psalms. And now I want to bring you to our text after rather a long time, I think. But it's all showing you the use of the Old Testament by the... Apostle Paul and now he comes to this text and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this cause I will cause confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name so here we come especially then to the worship of God just as Christ has come to his own people he, he confirmed the promises to them and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. This is, this is what the Christian life ends up being, really, is, is that what we have is that God has been merciful to me, a sinner, because Jesus has died for my sins. And so I live now as someone that's been freed from the threat of hell, the threat of the punishment that I would have have that will come to me at the end of my life because Jesus has, has come in, in place of what my sins deserve before God and so actually God has been merciful to me and then so the whole response of the Christian life is to glorify God to, we're to, to shine as people that have been, have been set, set free from this uh, terrible curse of sin that, that, that infected us as much as it infected anybody else and so the Gentiles these <laughs> pagan these heathen people can now glorify God for his mercy now we've expressed this this must be in unity with the Jewish people that are in the church already how are they ever going to join together and glorify God together maybe it's now obvious when the Lord Jesus says for this cause I will confess thee confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name and again he says rejoice ye Gentiles with his people and there he's on to another psalm Psalm 117 and quoting from it now I've really spent a long time to come to this simple point which I think I've now hopefully already uh, proven and I would have broken down any resistance to the idea that the Bible is given for the unity of the church for, for the ob obedience unto God it's, it comes in this whole section here using the Bible the people being of one mind and one mouth to glorify God it's, it's, it's almost uh, too much to not realise that this text here turning us back to Psalm 18 is turning us to the praises of God with which the people of God Old Testament and New will be of one mind and one mouth glorifying God together so Paul quotes from it using it as it is as a psalm of worship that belongs to this what's described uh, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning well how are we to learn from the Psalms obviously to use them as they're intended in the worship of God and even in here then glorifying God for his mercy and if we turn to Psalm 18 you'll see at the very beginning of it uh, well I should just tell you briefly just to show that quotation from verse 9 um, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name is taken from verse 
49 of Psalm 18. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, that's the nations, and sing praises unto thy name. Um, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles. Now it's David. Is it David? Or is it the Lord Jesus Christ here who's now doing this? David's dead. David's buried. But the Lord Jesus Christ has also died, but he's risen and he's alive and he's working in his people to confess among the Gentiles, to confess, to declare the truth, to sing unto thy name. So the Lord Jesus is leading this worship in this psalm. And you'd find that also in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, thank was something I read the other day that was pointing out this. He was leading this singing. Hebrews, just very briefly on a couple of these references. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. There referring to the Lord Jesus and a quote that is a quotation from Psalm 22 verse 22 I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee so in the Psalms we have the Lord Jesus Christ as in his humanity if you like praising God in his uh, fullness and then in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 57 Hebrews 10 verse 57 uh, it can't be can it five sorry verses 5 to 7 where from, from verse 5 wherefore when he cometh into the world he said sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So there we have in Psalm 40, another psalm of, of praise. We often uh, think of this psalm, I waited for the Lord my God and patiently he did bear. And we think of him, uh, the Lord, being patient with us, but how he brought the Lord Jesus out of a horrible pit. And there he declares then from verse 6, of Psalm uh, 40 these words here that he came in the volume of the book to do thy will I delight to do thy will O oh my God so Jesus Christ is speaking in these Psalms he's leading the people of God in we could say in the worship even of himself isn't it? we worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so we see some of this in in these psalms the great theme Christ leading the people of God in worship in the psalms they're not only written about him they're written they're written by him and as we we're hearing this morning about the spirit is so much the word is written by the spirit of God so as we as we read the Bible the Holy Spirit of God is can and should be and is working in in us as we as we fall before the Lord and so we see this here in the Psalms the same spirit the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Jesus Christ at work these words inspired by God what praises we have as Gentiles brought in together with this scripture that's written for us for our learning and written for all these uses all scripture is is inspired breathed by God and for every cause of instruction and rebuke and teaching and correction and here it is in this most spiritual of books the book of, of um, Psalms so we find yes this theme the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy 
and then he refers us to Psalm 18 and I said Psalm 18 begins here with the uh, title at the top of it which is uh, when it was originally uh, written uh, part of this is also in in the book of Samuel um, one of the last chapters of Samuel one of the last things that David uh, 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 wrote to the chief musician the psalm of David the servant of the Lord who spake unto the Lord the words of this song see it's a song to be sung in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul you see this experience that David had and he writes this towards the end of, uh, end of his life he was delivered from all his enemies and so he could this is a psalm to glorify God for his mercy uh, of a whole life that has been lived as a, as a king serving God in his generation as David did and he could sing I will love thee O Lord my strength People think the Old Testament's just all full of anger. But here it is. What, how could you put it any better? I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. This is the response of someone who has been um, has, has, has been the recipient of great measure of God's mercy. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And then he proclaims as in so many phrases the wonderful reliance that he has on God's mercy the Lord is my rock and my f I won't do the whole of this psalm by the way the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer and my God and my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised now there are these expressions in the New Testament but here, this is written specifically as a praise to be sung. The very words of God, a song in the day that the Lord delivered him. What is the song that we have in the day that the Lord delivered us from our enemies? By giving us faith in Jesus Christ. Knowing that there, there's no, no one can now, as it were, uh, take us to hell. Because Jesus Christ is taking us to heaven and uh, now we have this song and yet in the unity of the church the Gentiles in Rome they don't say oh we're going to go off and write our own songs no Paul directs them to the songs of Zion he directs them to the Psalms of David here in this text and in the next text and in, 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 in other, other verses here in this um, call for being of one mind of being one together what, a, what better way is there than <coughs> when the people of God gather together with the one Bible with the one hymn sheet as it were that God has given to them and so this whole psalm if you look at it it continues uh, looking ahead uh, I'll call upon the Lord so shall I be saved from my enemies verse 3 he's the Lord has delivered him in the past. He delivered them in, in deliver him in the future. And he looks back over the times. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, cried unto my God. This, these expressions, you couldn't have stronger expressions of faith. An assurance in the Lord Jesus Christ in his power to save and to deliver his people you couldn't have greater expressions of love towards God than is found in this word of the very word of God here given to the people of God to sing to the praise for that we might glorify God for his mercy the Gentiles now might glorify God his mercy how will they do it how will they start using these psalms in Jesus Christ and so <clears throat> uh, we won't go into this psalm any, any more now the time is time is is, 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 is gone I've 
draw you to verse uh, 28. It's one more text which we hope to sing if our voices will uh, permit us. What confidence in the Lord we see here. Is this your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. That is what the Lord does. He is the light. The light of the world. The Lord Jesus is the light of the world. But that confidence that David had in darkness. That God will give him light. And truth. And wonderful things here. So, we said really all that we need to all that we need to say here. We have unity here. We have glorifying God for His mercy. Gentiles being received into the church by Christ. We have Jesus Christ leading the singing of His people, and we have this great challenge then here uh, to be of one mind, one mouth. To glorify God and to be all by the word of God, as we say, the word of God. We're using the word of God in the Psalms. The best, the very best means. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Verse, chapter 15 verse 4 and chapter 12 again present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind I suggest to you that one of the best places to go in the Old Testament for the renewing and transforming of your mind is to the Psalms, the book of Psalms. And you would find that these demands upon a church full of very different people would greatly help. These are the Psalms of David, but they're more the Psalms of Jesus Christ. They're his Psalms and they're <coughs> insurpassable. They're in their sublimity, in their absolute biblical quality that we have the words of the Spirit of God given to us and uh, we do have to think but we've got time to think haven't we we must have time to think we must have time to stop to be still as that other psalm says and know that God is God and then when we sing these psalms we sing them as Christians the Jewish person has become a Christian, the Gentile person that has become a Christian sings the Psalms as a Christian. Someone said that the book of Psalms, though mostly written by David and appearing in the middle of the Old Testament, yet the book was actually finally put together towards the end of the Old Testament time and it was more that it was being prepared for us. As the psalmist said that they wrote of things that were they were looking into the prophets, even David was looking into with amazement and these expressions were given and prepared so that the church didn't need to start another hymn book but had been given one by the Lord. What a gift of God. Let's <coughs> glorify God. What mercy, what mercy from the Lord. What a saviour. And then you see, as we see here in these chapters, I am closing now, when we've come from those great chapters of being justified by faith, you think, well, what can we do? You read the great confidence in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit is interceding for us and Christ is interceding for us. Now he's given us words to sing, to glorify God together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if more of the Jewish people came and joined us and we said thank you for those psalms we've kept singing them and now we're looking forward to you 
joining with us and praising our Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. Let's pray. Almighty and heavenly and glorious Father, we thank thee, Lord, for thy great grace toward us, that us heathen may glorify thee for thy mercy with one mouth. We thank thee, Lord, that thou hast put a new song in our mouths and in our hearts. And Lord, we are deeply, deeply sorry for our neglect of the great treasury, the great wealth of the scripture that thou hast given, that we might know all thy ways more carefully and live for thee more honourably. Even this Lord's day, Lord, we've sinned, we've failed thee in so much. Yet thou hast been merciful to us and enabled us to come and gather in thy house and sing thy praise. O oh Lord, we pray thou would use these songs as we uh, study them in our homes, in our quietness. We look unto the hills whence come with our help. We have the Lord our shepherd leading us beside still waters through the valley of the shadow of death preparing a place for us. <coughs> we thank you for a good shepherd our Lord Jesus. We thank you for thy blessings Thank you for thy word that is sung about for the whole of Psalm 119 for 22 sections of 8 verses per section. All of thy word, thy wondrous word that works in thy people by thy Holy Spirit. All to praise thee. O oh Lord, we long for eternity. We long for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in power as we think on at this season of Advent, not only just for Christmas, but for the return of our Saviour in power and glory with the angels coming with all his people, bringing us into that place of eternal, everlasting blessing and worship in thee be given new bodies and strength and vigour to be free from pain and suffering. Oh Lord, give us that patience and endurance and comfort of the scriptures of which we read that thou dost promise to thy people and enable us with one mouth and one mind to glorify thee for thy mercy. Jesus' name.